on page 54 of the notes, and we're just starting into uh, file number 7, polynomial division and minimum phase. So now we have looked at filtering uh, by setting up poles and zeros in the z-plane, and that kind of explains why you can see uh, uh, filters and responses of instruments and, and things like that, uh, spectra defined by lists of, of complex numbers, you know, real and imaginary values. So we've uh, seen how to do that. We, uh, I, I showed you a little bit about the uh, z-plane tool that allows you to, you know, look at spectra and put in your own uh, uh, complex uh, poles and zeros and, uh, and filter data. Um, and maybe it would be a good idea to uh, give you a, uh, 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 just show you a little bit of, of what I had uh, done with that. So um, uh, when you, um, when you open up the data example um, in the uh, ViewMap program and uh, invoke uh, Z-Plane, you'll see this, this spectrum. And what we're looking at here is a single, um, a single shot gather from a, a marine seismic reflection. No, this has got to be a land seismic reflection survey. How do I know that? Because I see uh, down here these um, uh, surface waves, ground roll, uh, at a whole uh, uh, velocity spectrum of, of different, uh, um, uh, different uh, apparent uh, velocities, and they're low. You can see the, the hyperbolic reflections cutting through here. Time increases to the right, and distance from the source increases uh, up. Um, so you have the uh, first arrival, and you can see there's uh, you know, a lower velocity near the surface than uh, at uh, some distance uh, and, and depth, there's a, a refractor down there. Uh, and actually, that refractor probably also generates this reflection in here. Um, there's another major reflector, but you can see a whole stack of reflections, including some that are quite, quite deep. And this uh, data example goes down to uh, about 1.1 second. Uh, so we're looking at the upper part of some uh, uh, some basin probably in Texas or Louisiana, uh, but at least I can tell it's uh, onshore. And so here's in blue the spectrum of that data set, and if you um, you know you point at it, uh, okay, so we got uh, the first peak is at 26 hertz. That's probably these uh, very low uh, frequency things uh, in the surface waves in the ground roll. Uh, then there's a peak at um, uh, as I'm looking at it, uh, uh, 64 hertz, and um, that's a little bit suspicious. It's pretty close to maybe this is the, uh, you know, somewhere in here is the, uh, you know, power line uh, 60 hertz. Um, so uh, that's involved with it too. Uh, there could well be uh, a bunch of power line interference here since it's on land U.S. Uh, and 60 hertz makes sense. Um, and then there's this uh, high frequency, um, uh, this high frequency uh, uh, peak here, which is at uh, 115 hertz. And so, uh, if I uh, tap on the z-plane window, and um, then I, um, um, uh, I w what I want to do is filter this data set and. The, uh, I've set up a pole and a zero here, and the pole is closer to the unit circle, which is, of course, right down here. I've set up some zeros. You know, I want to get rid of the ground roll. I want to get rid of the 60 hertz uh, peak, um, which probably has some reflections in it, but maybe it's mostly the, the first arrivals, so I want to get rid of those if I can. Um, <clears throat> I want to get rid of the stuff that's up close to the... Uh, um, uh, close to the the Nyquist frequency, uh, and as you can see, there really isn't much there anyway. Um, and I just want to kind of isolate this peak and see what's what's in it. So 
I tap here and it says what I'll be filtering is the data example, okay, the one we were looking at, and I press uh, F and the filter data set pops up. Um, and what we can, can see is uh, now uh, we haven't gotten rid of all the ground roll. You know, there's still some response here in the, in the filter, but we certainly reduced it. Um, let's see, uh, the change in the, the, change in the um, overall amplitude is, uh, um, the change in the overall amplitude is uh, not significant. Uh, these are all, uh, you know, uh, 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 gained up to, uh, you know, whatever, wherever I want. Um, so let me try clipping it three times RMS. No, that didn't work. Um, I can do other things like I can look at the, uh, um, I can make the, the total energy in each trace the same. That's a, that's a uh, operator called uh, trace equalization gain, TE gain. Uh, so we do that. And uh, now we can see the reflections all the way across. And maybe I'll go back to clipping at RMS. Yeah, now I can see everything. Um, you know, I could apply uh, a uh, inverse time gain. I could apply uh, automatic gain control. Uh, you can see that that you know I really did uh, cut the amplitude of the uh, low frequency ground roll, but uh, I'm also not recovering a whole bunch of reflections underneath uh, that that ground roll. So you know maybe the one that's enhanced the most is is this this one that was pretty strong anyway. So, um, uh, you know, it's an example of, uh, of doing the best you can with, um, with filtering on the basis of uh, frequency alone. Um, and, you know, that's not uh, uh, the only thing that we can do. Actually, the stacking process, you know, following these hy hyperbolic reflection moveouts, uh, you know, solving the uh, uh, you know, this is a clearly a uh, service consistent static effect. Um, you know that that solving those kinds of problems uh, also helps. So uh, a lot of our more advanced processing will will actually do more to remove the the noise. But this is a good way to at least get started um, with this kind of filtering. And you saw that it was uh, you know quite fast. So um, you know it probably takes more time to uh, to you know, get the data onto the screen than to actually uh, do the computation. Uh, if we wanted to see, uh, I, I don't know, maybe I want to see what this, um, um, I'm going to go back and see what's in that, that peak. So I'm going to emphasize just that part of the data. And I put some more uh, zeros here. Um, you know, it gets the list of zeros gets pretty ridiculous, but um, uh, and I'll move this one around a bit. Um, you know, but I'm really I'm I'm really trying to emphasize just that that peak here. Okay, so let's see, and and in fact, it goes up so far now that it's it's cut off. You know, so so the the height of these uh, side peaks is. Not really, uh, not really very represented, but I, I can still try to kill them. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I'll go with this. Uh, just and you can look at the uh, ridiculously complex uh, filter time series that we're getting. You know, I probably got uh, I don't know eighteen uh, zeros and one pole in there, so you know it'll be uh, it'll be quite long. So uh, I'll just hit F again. And okay, so you know there is definitely some reflection energy in in that in that zone that I was actually cutting off. Um, well, let's uh, do a little bit more filtering. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So. Um, you know, I, I was losing some information, but but look at how, like this reflector that really defines, you know, the velocity, the move out, and the velocity very well down here. Look at how that's you know completely lost. So that the the best reflections in here 
are really in this upper peak and not in this lower one. So, you know, I might be quite willing to lose this, you know, in favor of of, of what's below. So, you know, this the whole intention of this tool is it lets you play with, you know, observe the spectra and and now, for instance, if I switch this to the the result I just got. Um, Uh, now you can see uh, the blue line, which you can barely see, is the spectrum that's left. You know, and, and of course it fits the the peak that I that I got. Actually, I'm kind of amazed that that they match so well in the plot. I didn't. I don't think I, I I intended them to match so well, or I didn't try. I thought I didn't try hard enough to make them match so well. But that's that's what you would expect. You know, there's really nothing left in here except this ringy information that. Uh, uh, you know, centered about 60 hertz. I'm not seeing, you know, uh, at least I'm not seeing a lot of power line noise up here, you know, before the first arrival. So um, there must be some other reason uh, why why it's kind of ringing at 60 hertz. There's a lot of energy at 60 hertz, but we can get rid of that and still have lots of good reflection information. So uh, that's all right. Okay. So that's a that's an example. A uh, practical example of, of using it, um, and now um, uh, we need to discuss some more of the uh, uh, of the methods that this is actually calculated and made efficient. So, okay, we have the original section, and uh, uh, you know, just we we just take it trace by trace. Every trace in that section gets worked on independently, and and we take its uh, z transform, and we have the input x. From the original section uh, in terms of z, and uh, that's the input to a filter, which is described in terms of uh, a z polynomial f of z, and then we get an output, which is uh, a uh, a z polynomial as well. Um, and then we, uh, you know, to plot that, I I just pull out the coefficients, and that becomes the time series. Okay, and that that's what gets plotted in the in the place of the input trace on the on the output section. So uh, you know, and you know, how is the filter working? Well, we uh, we take the input polynomial, we multiply that by the filter polynomial, and we get the y polynomial. So just algebraic multiplication. Uh, but we have this uh, uh, design of the rational filter, where we have a numerator um, z polynomial, which which contains all the zeros. So that's what had. <laughs> You know that that had uh, uh, I don't know 18 terms in it um, in that polynomial because it has uh, uh, nine, uh, 17 zeros, and then we had one pole, so there was only two terms in the denominator polynomial for the example I just showed you. Okay, um, so you know we, as you saw, I mean I could use as many poles and zeros in a different as as many different places as I wanted. Actually, actually, the denominator polynomial. I forgot about the conjugate uh, poles and zeros. So the denominator pol polynomial has two poles: it has the the pole you saw, and then it has the conjugate pole, you know, at the negative frequencies. Okay. Uh, so there's actually uh, three terms in this denominator polynomial. All right. Even though there's one, there's there's actually two poles, even though there's only one that we put in. Uh, and if I had 18 zeros, then I then I have uh, you know, for every one that's not on the real axis, I've got to have its conjugate. So there are probably uh, you know 35, 30, uh, uh, 34, 35 uh, um, uh, zeros in total. Okay. Uh, now the problem is that you know even I'm sure with the poll that I used, um, and uh, and you could see it. Um, um, you can see it here. Um, let's see, where'd that go? All right, so let's take a look at at the uh, the time series, right? With the pole in there, um, you know this this filter time series goes on and on. I mean, it's it's showing no signs of you know weakening. You know, its peak amplitude is actually over here. So who knows how you know how long that time series is? Let me take out the uh, let me take out the pole. Okay, and um, 
I think I could make the argument that the without the poll, you know, I just have uh, I don't know thirty six terms on the on the filter, so I have thirty six uh, or thirty seven uh, time points on the on the filter time series, and so it actually is going to be zero after this. I don't know if I can if I can remove a few uh, uh, zeros, maybe I can prove that. You know, and you'll see it. I mean, it, the the filter is going to use a much longer time series, but um, it's you know this is only showing it out to I don't know what I what I put in fifty or something. Um, yeah, you can see the the time series is getting shorter and shorter as I take out zeros. So it's actually you know it's actually limited length. You know, there's not there's nothing out there past whatever it is thirty six time points. Um, so. Um, um, but as soon as I put that pole in there, okay, it becomes it becomes infinite in in uh, in length. Okay, so how do we deal with that? How we do how do we do the division? All right, um, and and uh, uh, you know the um, so what's happening here is that the polynomial division of the numerator polynomial by the denominator polynomial, even though the denominator polynomial, you know, just has three terms. It's simple, right? But it's still it's leaving us with an infinite length polynomial overall in our rat. You know, once we divide it out, it's infinite length. And and so if we were if we were going to just convolve it, you know, by that infinite length uh, polynomial, you know, infinite length time filter time series f of t, then it would take infinitely long to convolve it. All right. So we do the polynomial division by recursion. Okay. That's the, the trick. I introduced that to you uh, uh, last week, I think. So uh, let's let's look at a simple two-pole, two-zero filter. Okay. So there are three terms in the numerator polynomial, right? So here we have, and, and uh, on uh, on um, what you would see in z, in the z-plane um, program would be one pole and one zero, right? Because this would be uh, a pole in its conjugate and a zero in its conjugate. Okay, so uh, it's really one, you know, one pole at one frequency and and uh, one zero that could be at a different frequency. Um, so uh, uh, the two zeros uh, make a, a, a second order polynomial which has three terms. Uh, so the numerator polynomial is uh, n zero plus n one times z plus n two times z squared. The denominator polynomial is, um, uh, and we, we, we have it normalized to uh, uh, 1 uh, plus, uh, we'll call it d1z plus uh, d2z squared. Okay, so there's two poles, and, and, <clears throat> and uh, uh, they also form a, uh, a three term polynomial. Okay, so our output is going to be you know, this polynomial divided by that one. Okay, and um, <clears throat> uh, and that's going to be multiplied by the input uh, x polynomial. So let's uh, rewrite it. Uh, uh, multiply both sides by the denominator. Okay, so we got the numerator polynomial acting on x, and we got the the uh, the output now acting on multiplied by the denominator polynomial. And let's use the the unit delay property of z here. Okay. Right, because y is going to get factored in here. Right, we're going to we're going to um, uh, distribute y into uh, the denominator polynomial. We're going to distribute x into the numerator polynomial, and so we'll get you know z times y of z and z squared times y of z. We'll get x times z squared, x times z. Right. So, what does that mean? Okay. We can use the unit delay property to actually get those out to the time domain. And that means that okay, so we get y times one. That's y of t. We've got d one z times y of z. Kazoo type. Um, so we have uh, d one uh, times uh, y at t, but then delayed by the one z. So it's y at t minus one. We have d two times y at uh, t times z squared, which delays it by two. So that's y at t minus two. We've got uh, n zero times x, okay, so that's n zero times x at t, n one times uh, x at t minus one, right, because it's delayed by one z, 
and n squared, I'm sorry, n2 uh, times x at t, and it's delayed by z squared, so it's t minus 2. All right? Now, what, what do we want to do here? We want to solve this for y at t, right? That's the current output. So we write down y of t equals n0 x times x at t, n1 plus n1 plus times x at t minus 1 plus n2 times x at t uh, minus 2. So this is the, the current input x at t. This is the, uh, the previous input, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the input one time step back, and this is the input two time steps back. Okay, and then minus d1 times y at t minus 1, and then I had made a mistake here, that's minus d2 times y at t minus 2. So we're using also using two previous outputs, right? So this is clearly recursive, okay? D one uh, y at t minus so y at t minus one is the you know one time step back in the output, and then y at t minus two is two times steps back in the output. So we've got to save the output somewhere, okay? So you know here's a, a you know you just have to pass this through the uh, the uh, pass this over the input once, right? Now there's a you know a fair bit of calculation going on here. But still, it's a it's a whole lot easier than n squared, and especially if if n instead of being thirty six is almost infinite, you know, or or we would probably feel like we had to retain it at least as long as the input uh, time series, right? Uh, you know, so n could be very large, and n squared is getting kind of prohibitive. Uh, but here, you know, it's just going to take uh, I don't know one, two, three, four, five. You know, five multiplications time you know per per uh, times n. You know, so it's uh, it's not going to be bad at all. Um, okay, so uh, in general, all right, if we just are worried about the uh, the pole part and the polynomial division, all right, uh, what we've got is x, the input x divided by the denominator polynomial. Times y, and we're, we're going to worry about you know the uh, numerator polynomial separately, okay? So so how do we handle this denominator, right? So we 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 clear it out, okay? So here's the denominator polynomial times times y, just like I did above, but now you know with generalized, and let's write successive coefficients of z, but but uh, causal, okay? We're not reaching back to to previous, uh, we're not we're not going to to future output or input, right? It's all causal. So you know, the coefficient of z to the zeroth power, which is just one, is going to be, um, you know, that's going to be. Uh, uh, here we're writing down this equation. So so the coefficient of z to the zeroth power on the right hand side it's x uh, zero, and on the left hand side it's y zero d zero. Z to the first power on the right hand side x one on the left hand side y one d zero plus y zero d one, okay, and then we go to um, and 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 I'm, I'm you know I I I've stopped generalizing right because I'm I'm keeping only three uh, three terms uh, from the denominator you know I don't know how long the denominator polynomial is but I'll I'll keep only three terms all right so uh, the coefficient of z squared is uh, 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 x two on the right, and and then this y two d zero plus y one d one plus y zero d two on the left, and then uh, uh, the coefficient of z to the third power x three on the right, and then we still only have two, um, uh, three terms of denominator polynomial, so we still have uh, you know now y three times d zero plus y two times d one plus y one times d two. So you know looking at these, you can see the trend. Okay, and so if you know here, I, I said the highest power of z in the denominator polynomial was um, was two, right? So n sub d is the uh, denominator highest power. That's the number. Um, it's the number of terms in the denominator minus one. Okay, so it's two uh, in this example. But let's generalize it. Okay, so now uh, we have. Um, um, 
we have uh, uh, you know an arbitrary uh, uh, highest power of z n sub d uh, in the denominator polynomial, and and now okay you can see how the calculation builds up you know for um, you know powers of z that are that are less than uh, less than two uh, or equal to two, but okay how do you build it up for a higher power when uh, um, you know when you're at uh, z to the, you know z to the third z to the fourth in other words the power of z k is greater than the highest power of z in the denominator okay and here's the summation you know you looking at these trends you could you could probably see this summation you know so we have y at uh, um, uh, okay on the still the right hand side we're still looking at the same equation right the right hand side we have x at k Okay, uh, and on the left hand side we have y at k times d zero, okay, plus the sum of i equals one to that um, highest power of z in the, in the denominator polynomial n sub d, okay, and we sum over uh, y at k minus i times d uh, sub i, okay. So we're just you know that's doing the uh, 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 kind of a convolution. Uh, you know, for the polynomial multiplication, at um, you know, for an arbitrary number of of poles, for an arbitrary number of terms in the in the denominator polynomial. All right. So now we solve this for y at k, right? Because this is always this is always y at it's not k minus zero. It's always k minus one or minus more than one. Uh, so we easily solve this for y at k. All right, so the current output is equal to x sub k, the current input, minus this summation, okay, uh, i equals one through uh, n sub d, right? So we have, um, you know, if you if you hear the the term uh, as you will in the in the uh, lab two, you know, a three term um, uh, uh, feedback, okay, then uh, n sub d would be um, Two, because you got one term here, and uh, well, actually, if you have three terms of feedback, then you have you could have n sub d equal to uh, um, um, one two one two three. Okay, so you have three terms uh, y, uh, and then and then you're summing uh, y at k minus i times d sub i. All right, and then you got to divide the whole thing by you know for the current output by d zero. So there's a little bit, you know, if you have a really long denominator, okay, if you got a lot of poles, you know, but this is this is really the difficulty here, the, the amount of calculations just, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, how long the, the filter time series goes on, it only matters the the it's just perfectly in proportion to the number of poles you have. Okay. So if you have hundred poles, it's gonna be a uh, uh, hundred times more difficult than having one pole. But uh, you know the fact that every single pole can be causing the time series to be infinite in length doesn't matter. Okay, this is this is just calculating it perfectly. It's not an approximation. It's a it's a per, it's just an ordering of the calculation like the FFT relative to the DFT that that makes it work much faster. Okay. So so now that we can we can efficiently and 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 uh, you can. Look at the source code uh, for uh, z-plane, and and I can show you exactly where that that summation is done. Okay, um, and uh, uh, I think uh, Clairvaud also refers to it in the book, and he gives uh, he gives uh, RAT4 or Fortran programs in the book, um, and in some of his other books he'll give uh, C programs um, or Fortran 90 programs. Um, and then in my uh, Z-plane code, they're in they're in uh, Java. Um, so, uh, but it all looks uh, fairly similar, you know, once you get into the guts of it, as long as you can recognize what's a loop and what's not. Um, and and I can show you where the summation is, uh, you know, and I can show you um, where the uh, uh, you know multiplying the poles together to get the uh, the denominator polynomial. I can show you where all that is. Uh, and it, you know, the actual guts of uh, um, 
you know, the computation, uh, it could be as little as uh, 50 or 60 lines of, of code. You know, everything else is uh, graphics and, and input and output and parameters and all that. Uh, Object-oriented uh, wrappers, uh, you know, that's all. That, that's what makes it, you know, a couple thousand lines of code. But, uh, but the guts of it that does all the work is uh, just a few lines. So uh, it's, a, it's efficient to program and, and, uh, and very efficient to uh, calculate as well. All right, so um, these, uh, these rational filters, okay, where we have a numerator and a denominator, all right, um, you know, they, uh, uh, the denominators can cause us some problems, okay, and we've got to figure it out. Uh, and this is going to answer the question, you know, why is it that in the z-plane field, you know, that you can, you can place poles and zeros you know, above this line here, and that means that these poles and zeros are all placed uh, outside the unit circle. Why does a z-plane program not allow you to, uh, uh, to place poles and zeros below uh, the unit circle? Okay, uh, and there's a reason for that. Okay, so let's see what the, what the reason is. Uh, in his original code, uh, you know, that I adapted, Clairbout did allow you with a with a control key to put a uh, a pole or zero um, below the uh, below the uh, uh, the axis here and into the uh, uh, into inside the unit circle, uh, but I didn't I didn't emulate that. Um, so you can read in the book about you know what what happens or or. And it'll be parallel to this discussion here of, of what happens. Okay, so you know we have a simple filter. All right, so let's call it uh, one minus z over two. All right, <coughs> so uh, um, and and that's a you know it's in the numerator. You know what if we want to invert that filter, right? So you know to to have what we call now that we've got the concept of rational filters, you know the way to invert a filter is to take it from the numerator and put it in the denominator. So here's the inverse of that simple filter, okay? So one over one minus z over two, okay? Uh, so we just have a polynomial of one in the numerator, and we have we have the filter now in the denominator. And you know what? I should not call it d. Um, I should call it n inverse, right? Because d is actually what's on the bottom. That's so. That's a, sorry. That's a little bit confusing given what we were just looking at. Um, so uh, uh, you know, d here now on these pages is one over the denominator. Okay, it's the full filter, but it's the inverse of of the numerator polynomial. All right. So uh, you know, if we we go ahead and divide that out algebraically, we get uh, uh, and and you know we can use the summation formula that that. That we just came up with to get this, if you want, but um, you know it, it, it's, it has an infinite number of terms, okay, and it's uh, one plus z over two, one plus z squared over four, plus z to the third over eight, um, and uh, you know we can evaluate this polynomial division with recursion, like we just did. We could use a Taylor series, we could use a binomial series. You know, there's lots of uh, mathematicians' tricks to dividing these polynomials. And and we can we it's 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 easy right because look at how the coefficients are going, I mean the coefficient the first coefficient is one then you know the second uh, time time point it's it's half then a quarter then an eighth then a sixteenth, um, is that right? Yeah, then a then a sixteenth. So uh, uh, you know no uh, no problem the. Uh, the the terms the size of the terms are declining pretty fast, okay. So you know most of the most of the, these first few terms you know really define the effect of the filter, and and after a few terms you know the 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 the, the uh, after a few terms the, uh, the the size of the coefficients is is so small that that they don't even matter. We don't have to worry about them. Um, but what if this this inverse filter was one over one minus two z. 
what if that was the case? Okay, then then we divide that out, and instead of having you know one plus one over you know z over two, we're gonna have one plus two z plus four z squared plus eight z to the third plus sixteen z to the uh, um, to the fourth power, and so on. So now the, the the coefficients of the terms are increasing without any bound. Okay, and this is a this is a serious instability. <clears throat> you know the the filter, um, you know it's it's a it's a reasonable filter to use. You know in the numerator, right? This one minus two z, we we could filter with that. That's it's not a problem. Okay, but if we invert that filter and put one minus two z in the denominator, okay, then then it's it's ridiculous. It's it's going to have it's going to have uh, you know the the very last term is going to be the largest one, and so uh, it's really not a useful filter. Okay, so that means that this this filter one minus two z, you know, we it doesn't have a useful inverse. Yeah, we can invert it algebraically, but we would never use it. You know, it'd be a disaster. Just blow up our data. Okay. Um, now, okay, let's examine what this uh, what this filter is. All right, one over one minus two z has a pole z p equal to one half. All right, and so the magnitude of that pole location is less than one. It's a half, right? There it is on the uh, on the z plane. It's inside the unit circle. Okay. Um, if you express this in terms of the, uh, and this this should be a red, these should be red omega zeros here, okay. So that's the complex omega zero. That means the imaginary part of the complex omega zero is positive, all right. And so uh, zp is equal to e to the i uh, omega zero, which is one half, okay. And the the imaginary part is. Uh, or i times omega zero is the uh, the natural log of one half, and omega zero is uh, is zero point six nine i. Okay, and all right, um, the uh, and so the imaginary part is positive; it's not negative, and that's going to lead to you know even the coefficients of the filter just blowing up. Okay, and that's obviously not a useful filter. Okay. So let's let's just formalize this into a, a definition of an inverse filter. We've got a filter uh, n of t. It's a filter time series n of, of t. It's inverse. We'll call it d of t. Uh, kind of hard to call it i of t, right? So we'll call the inverse d of t, and it's defined by uh, and and this green star here, which I don't know. It looks like a squash bug, right? Uh, the green star is, convol is a convolution operator, so we have n of t convolved with d of t. Okay, so if you convolve a filter with its own inverse, you know, as time series, then you're going to get the Dirac delta function. Okay, and and this, you know, so long as the coefficients of d are bounded, you can do that. If the coefficients of d are unbounded, like that. Like that one we looked at, you know, that had a pole inside the unit circle, um, then you can't do it. Okay, so it's not a useful, you know, the inverse is undefined uh, for that particular n of t. All right, so so you know we're just defining a sort of a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, uh, filter math, right? And so uh, you know, multiplying filters by each other, that's that's a convolution in the time domain. And you convolve a filter with its inverse, you get a Dirac delta function, you know, which has amplitude only at zero time. Okay. Um, now take that into the z domain. That means that the the n, you know, the filter polynomial n of z multiplied by the z polynomial for its inverse, which we're calling d of z, is equal to one, the polynomial one, you know, one times z to the zeroth power. Okay, and this will also work if n of z has zeros outside the unit circle. Uh, okay, so if the numerator has zeros outside the unit circle, uh, 
and then that that means that the inverse is going to have poles outside the unit circle. Uh, we can have zeros anywhere we want, okay? Uh, but if either of these filters has a pole inside the unit circle, then we can't define it, okay? We can't define that inverse, okay? Or at least we would never use it, all right? Uh, so what does that mean? Um, uh, and and uh, I didn't say it yet, but I'll say it now. Um, you take you take a uh, and, and I hope it makes sense. You construct a, a rational filter, right? So you take this uh, uh, this polynomial, okay, and it has zeros, right? Uh, uh, I mean, this polynomial it's all just you know in the numerator. It it can't have any poles, right? So this polynomial has has zeros. And you put those zeros into the denominator, and that means that all those zeros become poles. So you invert a filter; all the zeros become um, become poles, and likewise, all the poles are going to become zeros. Right. So if n had had poles, then uh, they would they would become zeros in the inverse of n. And and now that we've defined you know this rational filter, that's that's I hope easier to see, okay. And so, because uh, because zeros become poles when you invert the filter, if there if n has zeros inside the unit circle, then its inverse d is going to have poles inside the unit circle, and it ain't going to work, okay. It's uh, it's just going to be um, unbounded and and not useful. We can't we can't multiply those two polynomials if if d is an, an infinitely long and an increasing polynomial, uh, uh, you know, it's just going to blow up. Um, let's see. Um, another way to express this is that if we take the uh, um, we take the uh, the the original filter n. In terms of z, and then we define z in terms of omega, right? So we're just working our way successively inside here, all right? So we we take the filter, uh, we take the filter n, we we make we it's a, it's a time series, we get its uh, z transform, okay, and um, uh, and then it's a z polynomial called capital N. And then we uh, we take the Fourier definition of z, which really takes it you know takes the Fourier transform of the uh, uh, takes the Fourier transform of the um, of the uh, of the filter time series of the filter time series, okay. And if we invert each of those components of the Fourier transform, and then do an inverse Fourier transform. We'll get the uh, uh, we'll get the uh, uh, um, the the uh, that gives us the uh, inverse uh, filter time series. All right, so it's just another way of of doing it. I mean, it's easiest to do it by polynomial division, but we can get it through the Fourier transform as well, kind of a corollary. All right, now this definition of the inverse, you know, the the uh, the inverse Fourier transform only exists if the the polynomial for the filter has no zeros on the unit circle. Okay, so now we've got two different uh, two criteria here because we want the Fourier transform to be useful for these filters as well. We can't have we can't have a we cannot have a uh, um, we cannot have a pole. Uh, I'm sorry. We cannot have a zero uh, to be an invertible filter. We cannot have a zero inside the unit circle, and to be able to find the inverse filter with the Fourier transform, neither can we have a zero on the unit circle. Okay. So, so to us, an invertible filter has to. Obey both of those criteria, and it only has zeros that are outside the unit circle. They don't have to be far outside, but uh, 
They have to be outside the unit circle. Now, what we're, what we're doing here is we're working on a, a, a classification of time series. All right? And um, you know, when, I, when I record noise, uh, you know, as a seismogram, say, um, or you're recording my voice, you know, you've got some, some general time series. Okay? Um, so uh, you know, noise is clearly, you know, before you start recording, there's as much noise as as there is after you're recording. Okay. So if you look at a seismogram, for instance, and you look before the uh, uh, before the origin time of the earthquake, there's still noise on the seismogram. Okay. And there's also noise on the seismogram after the. Uh, um, the uh, origin time of the of the earthquake. So, so an earthquake seismogram, um, the noise part of it is is symmetrical. It's anti-causal, you know, completely non-causal. There's lots of stuff in negative time. Okay, the uh, uh, the part of the seismogram we're most interested in, you know, uh, at least initially, which is the the wave arrivals from that earthquake, you know, whose origin time we're looking at. Okay, that is causal. There should be no arrivals, definitely, according to physics. There should be no ar arrivals before the origin time of the earthquake. You know that would not be causal. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, um, and then I made a mistake in 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 this. You know what what property this this uh, criterion applies to. Okay. Um, all right, so so we divide all time series into the causal and the symmetrical, or the anti-causal, right? So we got noise and earthquake signal here, uh, and, and actually, uh, you know, the the biggest advances in, in earthquake seismology in the last ten years are when people started to look at the noise part, at this anti-causal part, um, and realized that we could make something out of it. There was real data in there. Uh, brilliant insight. Okay. So um, uh, then you can divide causal time series into several different categories. And one of those categories is time series that are realizable. Okay? And one way of expressing, uh, of, of, of saying, uh, one criterion for a realizable time series is that it's the magnitude of its z transform. Okay? You add up all the coefficients. Okay, and it's if it's less than infinite, then it's realizable. Okay, you and you can have causal time series that are non-realizable. I mean, they're not very physical, right? But um, uh, you know, there are there are causal time series that start at a certain time. They've got no negative time component, and then they you know they blow up from there. All right. So so uh, but to be realizable, you know, which is even you know more physical. They've got to obey uh, actually both of these uh, criteria, um, and 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 uh, through uh, Parseval's equation, uh, you can see that if you sum up, you know, the energy uh, in the whole time series, or you sum up the uh, uh, the magnitudes of, of all the coefficients, you got to be you got to be less than than infinite. You can't have infinite energy in anything physical, right? So we call it realizable. You know, it's real in some way. All right, and then one of the categories of realizable time series is this so-called minimum phase type of time series. All right, and we're going to examine that next. Um, it's completely invertible, minimum phase, and the inverse is causal. Okay, so it's invertible with a causal inverse. Okay, and and. Uh, uh, you know our, our earthquake uh, uh, wave arrivals should be minimum phase as well, um, but then there's many kinds of minimum phase um, uh, time series seismograms, uh, and a very particular kind that's useful to us in uh, exploration, you know, and in, and in matching well logs is this so-called impedance function, okay, which is just the the sort of random spike sequence of the uh, it's got a limited number of spikes. And, and each one is a, um, 
uh, a positive or negative uh, uh, reflection coefficient. Okay. So that's the impedance function, and that's useful in in uh, um, you know simple uh, modeling of seismograms from from well logs, reflection seismograms from well logs. Uh, it turns out to have a Fourier transform that is strictly positive. Okay, the impedance function. Uh, so that's uh, um, uh, that's a, a classification. Um, we've talked about realizable. Uh, we've talked about causal, causal time series. Uh, I've mentioned impedance functions before. Now we're going to find out this critical link. What is a minimum phase seismogram, and and what all defines it? So I'll go into that uh, tomorrow.